Okay, so we are going to dive in um, to what may seem like a backwards question um, for those of us still writing those first drafts, kind of in the middle of what do I do with the play now. This may seem a bit a bit retrograde, but to me it's really, really fundamental. And it hits a lot of the points that we're talking about today. It hits strategy, and it hit, hits art, and it hits community. Um, and the reason why is we're going to go actually backwards. The title of this class being How, When, and Why to Talk About Your Play. Which seems like, well, I need to have a thing to talk about, and I haven't written the things, so what are we even talking about? Um, but for me, again, this is a, a critical uh, way not only to um, be able to present and advocate for your play, but to me, back on fundamental level number one, how do you even understand what the hell your play is? Um, so that, we're going to start with, actually, as I said, we're going to go backwards. So we're going to start with the why to talk about your play. Um, playwriting often feels isolating, as you mentioned. If you're lonely, it's a pretty outside, we're in a lovely Bay Area summery spring weirdness, and um, here we are in a dark theater with fluorescent lights. Um, so why, why do we do this to ourselves? Why does anyone do this? Um, but for me, what happens uh, to take me out of that isolation, um, which can be in the forest by yourself, which you can um, know a lot of things about your play, but I always find that I don't know, beginning to, I don't know anything about it when I start talking about it. It's the cocktail conversation, right? When somebody goes, oh, you're a writer. Oh, well, what, what are you, you working on? And you're like, I... <laughs> yeah. All right, I'm going to start. Okay, so there's two eyes, and then this, and then this, that. But it's funny, because it's actually not very funny. Because it's then, and then that, is it, and then the, the glassy-eyed look of like, oh my god, I'm near an artist, run away, run away. Um, <laughs> so to me, that answering a very simple question becomes really difficult. Um, and it's because our plays mean so much to us and they are going to be so much, and they're layered, and they've got all the, the things. But to me, the more that you know your play, the more that you get close to understanding the, the fullness of it, that having that confident draft, um, the more easily you can answer that question. So to me, it's also a bit of a barometer, like how am I doing on this play? How, how, how do, I, do I know my play enough to answer the cocktail party conversation version of it? Um, and I will actually point out that you actually have a fabulous cocktail party conversation just on the movie that you were describing. Um, I want to see that movie, the, 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 what, what you, the way you described it, succinct, powerful, not doing the movie voice version of like, in the world. You know, we, we don't need to describe it as like a future Tony award-winning, Tony award-winning, the most romantic thing you've ever seen. Like we don't need to go crazy, but we need to speak with confidence, clarity, and assurance that the playwright knows what their story is. Um, which again is a, is a question to ask ourselves: Do I know what my story is? And the answer: It is okay to not know. That means you're in development, which we all are. Um, even the plays that Lauren is doing in their season, um, uh, which is amazing that we're going to see so many world premieres, regional premieres, premieres in progress, plays in progress. Those playwrights are going to be uh, still asking those questions. Um, even on second productions, um, I still go back and ask myself the same cocktail party conversation, and it's OK if it changes. Um, so again, the why to talk about your plays is because you have to. Not just for the world, not just for marketing, not just for conversations with people who might choose the play, or um, you know, uh, <laughs> applications. Uh, it's for you. It's for you to understand. So the, the thing that I always kind of go back to is there's always a question about the um, protagonists. And when you're starting a play, oftentimes you feel like, well, this is a play about like 10 people. It's about a family. It's not about one person. So critical questions, dramaturgical questions, are going to help you write, again, this three-sentence version that you can have in a cocktail party, the paragraph or two version that you might send um, to a literary director or an artistic director when they said, you told me about this play that you're doing. Um, what, so tell, tell me more about it in an email kind of uh, thing. Uh, for an application for a grant or to something like Sundance Foundation, I know when they do the, in their applications, they tell you to describe the play and to describe kind of your, your process in it. Um, and then, uh, so, so all of these things are going to require you to, to talk about the play. And one of the, the games that I always play with myself is when I'm writing in the middle uh, of a play, which I'm always in the middle of about a <laughs> play. Um, describing them is really hard, but describing a play I've never written that I might want to write is really easy. <laughs> so this the sense of going, um, and we can literally make it up in the moment, going, uh, it is 
It's, it's funny and heartwarming. There's a big twist at the end that makes you believe in love all over again. Um, it's also set in 1932, and uh, it's about women um, triumphing uh, in a man's world. I, I literally just made that up. I don't know what play that is. <laughs> but I'm like, I would buy a ticket to that. That's great. Yeah, that sounds awesome. So sometimes I actually reverse engineer it. We're going, can I describe a thing and then try to aim towards that <laughs> instead of having a thing and trying to describe it? Um, all of this is to say the power of describing the story is part of the making of the story. Um, and it's a way that I always go back, it's like a flagship, a boy in the middle of the ocean when you are, as you were talking about Damien, feeling like, how do I end this thing? How do I, what is it? Um, it was this one thing and now it's another thing. Um, oftentimes going back to that conversation. So how, how do you talk about it? Um, the how is actually oftentimes each other. It is literally sometimes my three-year-old, my dog, um, it can be my husband, it can be a trusted colleague, it can be Laura, um, people around you that are professionals and non-professionals, it actually doesn't matter. Because what it is to speak openly about something helps you organize the idea in your mind. So even having to face the question and saying, okay, Sometimes even the title is hard. So it's a play called, well, it's got a couple titles. I mean, I started calling it this, but then I don't know. And I didn't. Right, so find, finding a way to speak confidently about that story um, with the uh, awesome titles are very helpful. Um, and it's part of the game I tend to play when I'm in the early stage is, and this sounds a little shady, is thinking of marketing. Not to project into the Lincoln Center version of where my hopes and dreams live, but to say, what is the image, what is the tone of this play? What would, what would a marketer need to know about this um, uh, with, with trying to get people to come see it? And that further asks the question, why would people want to see this? Um, so um, the how is oftentimes literally can, as I said, it can be my, my husband saying, all right, I have this idea. Just let me, let me talk it out for a minute. Knowing that that first conversation is going to be rocky, is going to be like, um, I don't, uh, let's see, it's about three people, it's set kind of here, but then a flashback here, like all of the crazy version when you're trying to organize your ideas, it will be a mess at first. But again, the more you know your play and the more you answer those questions, the more you can talk confidently about it. So the secret to how to talk about your play is answering questions. Um, and it goes to your point about how do you finish a play. Um, oftentimes what gets us trapped what gets us um, uh, in that terrible writer's block kind of phase, which I, I choose not to believe in writer's block, and I, don't, I encourage you to also not believe in it. Because um, you can always write something, and it can be terrible, and it can be just emojis, and then you can delete it, and it's fine, but you have written it, and it's okay. <laughs> there is always an answer. <laughs> um, um, and so, so part of what, we, what we're doing is um, figuring out that way to break through that seal uh, of indecision. And it's really, um, sometimes you have backed yourself into a corner and if you feel like, wow, I've written 30 pages of a thing or 50 pages of a thing and I don't know even where to go next. Um, my, the way I encourage you to back up and untangle um, is to go back to that beginning space in your mind. You don't necessarily have to highlight and delete every scene but the first one, but <laughs> maybe don't do that. Um, but is to ask yourself at the beginning, where are we going in the end? And because that's really what the entire process of playwriting is you asking yourself, how does it end? Um, and it's a scary question because it presumes that you have a thing that's worth ending, that you've made it awesome, and that it will end in a beautiful way. But that, and this is a lot of what I teach in my craft classes, um, that is what, that is the actual scariest, truest, and most necessary question to answer. How does it end? Where are we going? Which expands into not just how does it end, why does it end, when does it end, who does it end with, all of these things are the reason why those audience members are gonna sit there and finish your play, because they wanna know how it ends. So the sooner that you can understand that um, and feel confident in going, okay, uh, I know where we're going. Um, and my sneaky secret, which sounds like I just wake up and I'm like, great, I have the full idea in my head, I know how it ends, I'm just gonna start typing. Of course it doesn't work like that. But the question becomes, if you reverse how you start to think about the play, again, in this cocktail, um, conversation, co cocktail version of answering that question. We always start at the beginning, right? Here's the title, and here's a person you're likely to see in the first five minutes, and here's kind of an ish, a thing that they may or may not want, and they may or may not get it. And uh, stay tuned. <laughs> so that's all beginning stuff, right? Which is, of course, very necessary, and you will definitely have to battle that exposition. Um, but frankly, that's the easy stuff. Starting a play is pretty damn easy. You can start it about anything. 
It's always the question of how it ends, where it's going, and who's left that matters. Um, so, again, the sooner you can think about in when you talk about your play, going all the way to the end, the finishing the idea, finishing the sentence. Um, and we will talk practically about when you're talking about your play in terms of submission, don't go all the way to the end. Yeah. But for you, yes, please, as soon as you can go all the way to the end in your mind, you have a play to write. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I will say that as many times as it takes because that is critical. Um, oftentimes, and frankly, some of these plays still get produced that don't have endings. Um, but they have the kind of dot, dot, dot endings, which drive me crazy. Um, <laughs> but sometimes they still get produced if they have very famous people in them. Um, <laughs> so, but what does it mean to think about the end um, of the play? Um, and the question is that, that the, the kind of strategy version of how, how to talk about it um, is uh, when you think about um, the end, you don't have to think of everything about the end. And I've used this in my class before, and I'll use it again because it makes me laugh. Um, when I imagine Shakespeare writing Hamlet, if he were thinking like me in this way of, let's okay, say, I know that it's about some fathers, some sons, some uncles, some kingdoms in trouble. I think I'm going to have a ghost at the beginning. <laughs> Maybe a woman. <coughs> no, I'll just kill her. <laughs> um, we are going to now, in Shakespeare's mind, jump to the end. So the question becomes, who is the play about? What do they want? Do they get it? The end. <laughs> that is one of the greatest plays in Western literature, can fit in that Mad Libs -like, um, box, which your play should as well. And I will say that that does not limit the play take, for example, Hamlet, from being as poetic, as revolutionary, as memorable, as wildly emotional and surprising <coughs> as it is. But it's still in the engineering core of what that play is. That is the play that we're looking at. Who is the play about? Hamlet. What does he want? To revenge his father. Does he get it? Yeah. Yep. Yes, he does. The end. <laughs> right. Miss all the good stuff. But when you have that structure, now you have a thing that you can walk confidently up that hill and jump off the ledge, and you have done the thing that you've promised your audience to do, and add all the crazy shit you want <laughs> in the middle. All of the art, all of that voice and vision, dreams, language, music, whatever. But if the structure is there, which is what this asks you to do, when you talk about your play, you can spend time talking about theme, all of the hilarious um, character details, but that's not what people are going to want. That's not what's going to tell them, what is this play? Where is it going? When is it over? <laughs> um, and to me, what that is, is a, a conversation about satisfaction. Because when a play ends in a way that is surprising and yet predictable, that you have set up from the beginning, and uh, people go, oh my god, that was it. I was doing it the whole time. Oh my god, that thing that he wanted, it was like what he wanted, but different. Ah! Right. <laughs> It will feel satisfying, and um, if this were a different class, I would talk about the biological reason for that satisfaction, but trust me that humanity has evolved with storytelling. Storytelling is a tool to teach us something, to make meaning that is satisfactory so that we will remember it forever. That is a reason why this type of storytelling exists, is to become so memorable and so gasp-worthy and so funny um, and so like, oh my god, it's like me. I know someone like that. Oh god, I've been there. Right? All of that is to become a part of our human story, our personal human story. So all that is to say, it happens in the ending. So again, the art version of what we're talking about, and this is just a little playwriting strategy because we've several of the questions have been kind of about how do I finish that full length? How do we take this idea to that next level? And you finish a play at all. Um, uh, and it blends into, now that you have the play, what do I do with it? Um, and I think this is one of the first things you do, is talk about it. So let's back up for a second. For the art version, commit to that ending, and I will finish the Shakespeare story being what he's about there, he knows the play is about Hamlet, he knows, a la with his ghost idea, awesome ghost idea, to have his dad be like, P.S. Hamlet, I was murdered, your uncle did it, maybe do something about it. Um, Hamlet's like, cool, I think I will try to figure out if you are in fact a real thing and not, I'm not crazy. Um, if he actually did it, and if he did, I will, do, I will decide maybe to do something about it. That's the whole play. So the question for, for Shakespeare, um, as he's rolling in his grave, is um, that when he imagines the end, before he's even, say, written, maybe he's written one scene or two or that first wonderful act, 
And then he's like, okay, you're really gonna know where we're going here. <laughs> so he projects to the end of the play, which to answer the question of what, who's your main character, what do they want, do they get it? Let's say he goes, all right, so maybe he doesn't get it. That's boring. So maybe he does get revenge. Okay, okay, yeah, let's just say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make the decision. Aha, this is his moment. He's making the decision. Hamlet will get revenge, cool. Now that doesn't actually tell you anything about the ending of the play, but you can write almost the entire thing knowing that he is going to get revenge, right? So all of the complexities that you build in, okay, well, why can't he just walk up and kill the guy if he thinks he did it? Well, he needs to figure out if he did it. Okay, so there's all scenes about when we'll catch, you know, catch the conscience of the king. I'm gonna listen, I'm gonna pretend I'm crazy and then people tell me shit. I'm gonna act all this stuff out. I'm gonna maybe kill myself or think about it. Nah, I mean, nah. Um, <laughs> all different stuff happens, right? Well, then he gets clarity, right? So now, what, so if he's going to get revenge, we're going to, at some point in the play, since he has decided Hamlet will get revenge, all right? Well, Hamlet's got to really believe that the king, uh, king did it. Okay, cool. So we're going to overhear by under the, well, you know, he's going to overhear and praying, and then, well, why can't he just kill him then? He's going to go to heaven. This jerk doesn't deserve to go to heaven. Great. Act three. We're like booming all the way through this play. Awesome. Um, and, you know, so all of these things, once you decide that ending, that he's going to get revenge, you can reverse engineer all of these plot steps that, again, are just engineering to help you get to to be or not to be, to help you get to Ophelia coming in with that weird-ass, wonderful, flowery monologue before she kills herself, right? All of these iconic things happen, um, and it sounds a little cold when you describe them structurally, but they are there so that we can enjoy them and feel that satisfaction in the end and hear that poetry and commit to Hamlet's struggle and to really feel all the things that a play can make you feel. So again, at the end, he's decided he's getting revenge. He sets up this idea, why don't I have a freaking sword fight? Great, sir. So, but now, once we has written this whole thing, and I'm telling you this to say that you can decide on the end of a play and still have bursts of creativity and surprise once you actually get to that point. So if you know he's gonna get revenge, getting revenge doesn't mean that he dies. What if Hamlet dies? Oh, that's great. Okay, wait, you know what? Everyone's dying. Awesome, this play's gonna be so great. We're gonna kill everybody. All right, so now, all of that doesn't change the fact that Hamlet, Hamlet Shakespeare has decided to have his character get revenge in an awesome way, right? Hamlet, once Laertes um, admits that the king is to blame, he literally says it out loud in front of all the most important people in Denmark. Of course, this incredible scene, Laertes says the king's to blame. The next thing that Hamlet does to answer the question, does, what does your character want revenge? Does he get a yes? He decides in this moment, after confirmation, public confirmation that the king is guilty, takes the poison cup, says, follow my mother, and the king starts to die, right? Awesome, oh my god, it's so beautiful. <laughs> but again, structure, structure, structure. So, all of that is to say, you don't pass. Okay. Uh, good night, sweet prince, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, but all that is to say that in the conversation that, had, that Shakespeare maybe had with Kit Marlin, or whoever was around at that time, I think Kit died earlier than that. Anyway, he had a friend, I'm sure. Um, uh, um, when he's talking about that, deciding that ending thing is great for your creative process because, again, that's what's going to make the play the play. Um, and if you wait till the end of your play to figure out what the end is, it's probably not going to end. Um, or not going to end with any conversation to what you were doing at the beginning. <laughs> um, it may be a really long play, like a 400-page play, that if you knew where you were going in the first play, it might be like a 90 minutes straight through. <laughs> Um, so again, all of that stuff is to, um, the bravest thing that you could do is go, I have this idea, let me just jump, crazy jump to the end, to go, what the hell is this about? Um, and the more times that I learned that, that was a critical moment in my process of going, oh, and also it helps you decide if this place worth writing. If you have an idea and you're like, I think the end has to be where everyone dies and there's no hope, I don't want to write that. <laughs> I want to write something else. So, um, anyway, or maybe you do, and good luck. Um, okay, so so now we're going to ba jump back, back into strategy. So let's say you have this awesome play, you've answered the question of how it ends, you've written this great thing. Um, the When to talk about your play, um, again, after, during the, the process of writing it and understanding it, um, my very first thing I like to do is to get, um, somebody mentioned this, a table, you can of us, being invited over to someone's table. I literally have people over, and I always make the same vegetarian chili and serve wine and have actors over, and pay them, please pay your actors, please, even just a little bit, something, because their talent is what makes our talent awesome. So, reminder, just pay some off, pay them. Um, um, have them over, and we read the whole thing out loud. 
And oftentimes, before the reading starts, there's always the person that they turn to you and go, would you just tell us a little bit about your life? <laughs> and so here we go, once again, you are met with that question. Um, and in that context, in the context of a very first reading or early readings, or even a reading when your 10th reading at a major over theater, <laughs> um, what do you want to say to people that are about to experience your play? Obviously, don't give away the big twists, but to, to talk about the things that are important to you, um, that makes this play work. And feel confident in telling those people. What I tell people is, keep that pace going. My plays do not work unless you pick up your damn cues. Go fast, pick up your cues, feel confident. And of course, in a mini week to rehearsed play, you will find that natural rhythm. Um, but telling people up front will mean that your 90 minute play does not take three hours to read in the first reading. Mm -hmm. um, so things like that, very practical things, feel free to say that. That is not um, inappropriate um, to share. But also tell the, the, the core of what this is. This is a love story. Right? Or this is, this is a tragedy, and we're going to go to dark places. Um, or whatever you want. But again, finding, a, this is asking you again, finding ways to speak and own your story. Um, and the more that you can attach words to it, and tragedy is a big word to attach, so it may feel weird to do that, unless you wrote a tragedy, and then you're like, way that high, baby. So <laughs> we really have to, to find ways that you can, you can describe your play. So in that context, awesome. And we'll talk about getting and giving notes. Uh, in a later session, um, so we won't talk about that first read and all freak out and the many scribbly things that you need. Um, but the other context of when and how to talk about your plays, okay, let's say you've had a couple of those readings now, maybe even some professional readings, um, and you are in a context where you may be able to speak about your play or email about your play to a person in power, a decision maker. Maybe it's in a literary department or artistic department, a dramaturg, a director that you really admire, or like Uta Hagen. <laughs> Just to pick me up, and you're like, I just sent the play. What? How did you do that? <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so, but again, um, I would say start as small as you can. Three sentences. Um, can you describe your play in three sentences? Um, can you describe it in one? Uh, oftentimes, when you're writing log lines for for TV pilots or for movies, you'll be that is the worst part of that job. Is like I can definitely write a full length movie in a screenplay, but writing a log line is like. It's crazy because the log line is like literally one sentence, <laughs> like 15 words that describes your whole the whole reason you wrote it. So it's a terrible and wonderful exercise. Theater is luckily more open than that. But again, what is the way to 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 talk about your play? And it goes back to the same question we started: Who's your play about? What do they want? Do they get it? You may not have to include all of the do they get it because that's a little bit of the like mm, tune in to see what happens. Um, but to say uh, this is a insert adjective play, funny. Moving, um, contemporary, historical, period, um, farcical, you know, find a noun, some nouns and adjectives that you are super comfortable telling the world that you, um, that describe your play. Uh, describe the main character um, in a few words. It can even be, this is a, let's write a play together right now. This is a um, uh, historical, uh, let's say, this is a, um, a comedy, uh, a historical comedy um, about the industrial revolution. I know <laughs> industrial revolution um, that follows one woman's um, quest uh, to find love and make an amazing scientific breakthrough. <laughs> sure, that sounds great. I feel like I've written that play. <laughs> um, but anyway. Finding the non-terrible, like I just did, version of that um, is going to serve you over and over and over again. It will continue to remind you um, what you're writing when you get into rewrites, when you get notes from people in power and you go, do I listen to those notes? Are this is my thing? I don't know, I forgot. Literally write it down. Put it over your computer or have it in your pocket or stick it on your laptop so that you can always look at it and be like, right, that's my thing. Um, so, uh, the other context you might be using this for, um, you may need a paragraph or two about it. And this comes in handy when you're pitching an idea for a show, or if it's a show you've written but you are pitching it in, to a specific person for a season. Um, you can describe it in uh, a paragraph or two. Um, the first paragraph is usually a little more general, the second paragraph is a little more plot specific. Um, so you can say to somebody um, who's interested in political plays, um, or feminist plays, or historical plays, or just comedies, or whatever. Um, the way to giving them enough clues to connect with who's reading it with, with your work. So that also requires not only knowing how to talk about your play, but what who you're sending it to. 
So this is that strategy thing. Um, if you're sending it to a political um, theater company, um, I think uh, Interact or something is, is known as a, um, they do very political, uh, political work. There's a bunch of DC companies that do it as well, and companies here too. Um, knowing how to shift that language for that, for that um, company is gonna be really helpful for you. Um, this is a, a piece that does not flinch away from contemporary politics or whatever you wanna say. Um, the things I would steer away from when talking about um, yourself is to not do the award-winning, fabulously pink-haired playwright <laughs> Lauren Gunderson's new hit play. Right, that sounds ridiculous. <laughs> so you can be confident but not um, showy. Uh, and I think one of the things that actually helps in theater um, is being personal. So oftentimes in the last line of such a description or somewhere in an email, I will say why I wanted to write this, why this is a play for me. I've, you know, since I had my first child, I've been really struck with the complexities and emotions of motherhood, and this was an important play for me to write. Oh, wow, is somebody getting that? All of a sudden, it's not like another pitch. It's like, well, this is a person that wrote this and has a reason to write it. So I think that part of, again, brings back into this question of community and the self. Um, why you? Why did you write this play now? Which is actually what many um, artistic directors and literary folks want to know. Uh, and marketing people, for that matter, too, when they're telling audiences to come, why would they choose this thing to come to, of all things that they could download and scroll or <laughs> can go to? Um, why you? Why this story? Why now? So those are great things. Um, uh, to focus on too. So again, I hope this gives you a tiny sense of part of your job is actually the story behind the story. Um, so talking about your play helps you writing it. Awesome. Um, and uh, it also helps you when getting people, to send, 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 sending it out in the world, um, finding those conversations, even if it's just a director to get feedback, or a dramaturg to get feedback, or hey, I'm pitching this to you, or an actor, hey, you would be great in this, or you'd be a great director, let's talk about this together. Um, and all the way to opening night at that toast or the first rehearsal or an interview with the newspaper that they are, you know, promoting your show. All of these questions you will get asked. Um, so I hope you can see how being able to talk openly about it, finding your language, your way to talk about it helps kind of from the beginning to the end of the process. So, okay. Now, we're going to shift into uh, question and answers. Notes can be really hard um, to take, especially when factoring in if you don't have that great theater reputation, that massive resume just yet, um, you are often very grateful to be in the room at all. And it can feel difficult to stand up for yourself if you are in disagreement with someone of power. Um, and I will say the thesis of this whole talk is about playwright confidence and owning your voice, which means you need to know it and practice it on your own be confident in it once you have it, once you find it, once you know this is who I am, this is what I want to do, this is what I'm about. Because people are going to challenge it. That's part of what the art form does. It's all about um, challenging every single thing you put on the page. Because that is the job of great actors, directors, dramaturgs, designers, everybody, and audiences, is to go, did you mean that? Did you mean this? How about that? Are you sure about that? Um, which is great. Because at the end of that awesome process, you're going to be like, I am confident in every freaking thing in this, <laughs> in this script. But it is from the first draft you write, I will often say, when I teach, and at this very moment, um, the work begins once the script is done. So in some ways, sorry to scare you, the work begins when you've gotten that first draft and you're ready to go into rehearsal, into that first reading. That is actually start the clock all over again because the work is starting afresh there. Because um, this is why I like to, to write really quickly, and have the idea, and why I like to think about, again, that ending. Get through the draft, get it. Now you have a thing that can, every time you look at it and workshop it, gets the better version of that thing. But you really can't have the best version of the thing until you have a whole thing. <laughs> so it's hard to make an amazing full-length play when you only have the review great pages. <laughs> so again, once you get the book done, that's, um, so oftentimes, I'm gonna be very honest, the first draft of a play, even the first draft I turn in of a commissioned play, 
is often, I know, imperfect. It is not exactly right, and I will even say some, <laughs> and very, if, if I'm under a deadline, there might be a chunk of the text where it goes, some great stuff happens here, she forgives him, it's gonna be fine, next thing. <laughs> so just so <laughs> it can, um, and not everyone works like that, and I think that is uh, specific to my relationships, people who worked with me a long time and know that there actually will be something great there, <laughs> or some version of, of, of great, or decent, let's be honest. Um, <laughs> So anyway, but once we have that draft, then the work begins. And the work often begins, as we mentioned, with those living room readings, surrounding yourself with people you trust, surrounding yourself with talent. And this is actually gets to one of these questions about, what is it? oh yeah, under the knees, casting. Um, casting is massive, and it is sometimes 90% of the work of getting a great play to its greatness is finding those people to be in it. You can learn a lot from crappy actors, I'm telling you. You can learn a lot, and you learn it very quickly. <laughs> so we joke in the theater sometimes about making a play actor-proof. Um, and of course, no play is, is actor-proof. You can ruin anything. <laughs> um, but, but the truth is, you do learn a lot from, from all sorts of um, levels of talent. Like, if Meryl Streep's in your play, it's probably going to be a really good play. <laughs> um, and that may have nothing to do with you. Um, but uh, finding those, this is why I advocate finding those people, finding your people, your directors, your actors, they get your work. I have a certain rhythm, speed, pace that my work really excels when it's, when it's in that kind of space with a kind of humor, um, a kind of speed, um, which if you hear me talk for very much longer, you see how fast I talk and how much I interrupt myself. And that pattern goes right into my work, so the people who know me and work with me know that, and we can skip several hours of rehearsal and just it, it, upon reading a new play with those people who know, like, all right, I know how Lauren writes. So finding those people is gonna be nothing but good news to you. But also, again, working with people who are not like that will expose the patterns that you might have <laughs> in, in your play. So that is one great version of notes, is just your initial reaction. And this is the one that you can always go back to. Always trust this one first. When you hear a reading of your play, even if it's around your dining room table, your reaction. Take notes, have the script in front of you. I prefer on an actual piece of fibrous paper. Um, take notes, uh, and you will develop a shorthand, which is very akin to your style of writing, which is the, you know, whatever version that tells you this line needs to be reworked, cut this all of this, <coughs> this absolutely get out of my play, never want to see you again. Something more here, I don't understand, there's a transition needed. Um, you know, all of those notes you will hear on the first read. Um, so I will say, the first note giver is, is yourself. Always trust that person. And this is for when you're all the way into previews, opening, you know, going on to this, your second you know, West End, whatever, sitting in the audience and hearing your version of things. Because that's the only one you can trust. That's the one that's not going anywhere. Right? Um, and so you will have a lot of people, a lot of interpreters. That's part of why theater is amazing. It's a bit of a whiplash for playwrights because we're alone for a long time and then suddenly everyone is there. <laughs> And they're all doing and needing their, their own things from your script, coming to you with questions or bulldozing right past you. <laughs> and you need to be able to know that script and know your own instincts um, and trust them. Or else you're just going to be in the wind the whole time of whoever's on your side or whoever wants to change it. And there are nightmare stories, especially younger writers, um, who don't have the experience to know that, yes, you can stand up to the artistic director of a very fancy theater and say, you're not understanding, well, that's not the play I wrote. You can say it, you can absolutely say that. In fact, there's several times I wish I had said that. Um, but I was, again, so grateful to be in a space that it took me a long time to be able to do what I eventually did, which was totally break my cool in this artistic director's office and bang on his desk and be like, that is not the point of the play! So maybe don't get to that point. <laughs> Uh, and there are a lot of strategies to have to not get to that point, which we can, which is part of this conversation about notes. So, first, foremost, you're the note giver that matters. Second, build a circle around you with people that you do trust, um, and this is friends, family members, other colleagues. You can trust people in a lot of different ways. There can be the pro playwrights that are your friends um, that you know. Uh, they can give you that kind of like, you know, I saw a play uh, in New York last week that was kind of like this, like whatever, that kind of real into theater kind of person. And then there's people, I'm married to a person who oh, I really, really trust because he doesn't see as much theater <laughs> as I do. It has nothing to do with it except for the plays I tell him to go see. So, um, and his, but he always asks these great, great questions that are more like the questions most audience members might, might bring to it. Because um, they're not, you know, 
Peter Nerd is always like us. So, but again, that's obviously a, a very important quest, um, um, circle. And then you kind of get bigger and bigger out of that, of course. Uh, that first group of actors, whether you have chosen them or not. Again, anybody who has an opinion about your play, it is fine for them to, to give that opinion unless you say, I really don't want that opinion. But it doesn't mean you have to take it. In fact, you probably shouldn't. Um, there are a lot of notes that can come from a very generous place. That does not mean that they need to make, uh, make it into your work. It can actually be a thing um, where you can retain that question in your mind, uh, and my favorite answer is, I don't know, or that's a great, that's something to think about. You do not have to, it's certainly in a setting, whether it's a talk back, whether it's that first reading or the first preview or whatever, if there's a question or a criticism uh, that comes from anybody, you don't have to respond right then or ever. But you can also just say, I don't know, that's a, that's a great point, yeah, let me think about that. Um, and you actually can think about it, or you can blow them off and never think about it, either way. <laughs> you can say the same thing. Um, but the truth is that you're going to get a lot of these um, pinging at your play. Um, and it is in no way a part <coughs> of your play's weakness if these notes do mean something. If somebody does crack open an amazing um, moment in your play that you hadn't thought of before, that's nothing but good news. And in fact, the secret the secret truth of playwriting is that some of our best ideas come from designers, actors, dramaturgs um, that ask the right question, that open the right scene, that make you go, oh my god, that's the scene I've been I didn't know I even needed to write. That's happened to me so many times, so many times. Hilarious lines um, that I, it says my name on it, but that was definitely a discovery by an actor in the room that was like, oh god, make that joke. I was like, that's a right joke. That's going in there. So that is part of the collaborative nature of this. Um, so there's so much good that comes out of criticism, and it's not like you're on the firing line. Um, but it can, there are certain, there's certain times when it, when it can feel like that. So part of the developing that confidence, and I think having a couple strategies to know how to accept criticism, not turn everything into a fight or a weepy battle, or um, they don't get me, I'm not ever showing up again. Um, because again, this, this business is of course all about relationships. So being able to have a conversation that is productive and critical without destroying <laughs> relationships, or, and what I actually care about, destroying your play. There's been a lot of, of, of um, stories that have happened where Peter Steamroll, director, takes over and makes it what they want instead of um, having the, the intention of, of the playwright where an actor asks for too much and takes all the air out of the room and then suddenly the play is only about that character because that's the one you've had to think about. So um, I think some of the ways to get started in these relationships early on and one thing I encourage every playwright to do at the beginning of a relationship once there is a director involved um, and a dramaturg as well is to have a very open, very literal, have a conversation about what the point of the play is, what moment it is, what scene it is, what is the climactic decision point. Um, go over all the basics. Who's the main character? What do they want? Do they get it? We talked about this at the very beginning. That's still the conversation at hand. So you would be shocked um, if you talk to some directors that may not actually have decided that yet, or may not know, or he may have, or it's kind of worse if instead of saying, I don't know, what, what, tell me what the point of your play is, which is the right answer. <laughs> um, you, you, you tell me, playwright. Um, that they might assume something else and go full force towards uh, 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 directing a version of this play that ends in a place that you didn't end it. <laughs> that is somebody else's main story, is that they're making that the main character of the story. This is, this is not crazy. Um, so again, having that language early on, which to our first point about being able to talk about your play, that's when it's gonna be really helpful to have a director say, okay, you tell me in your own words what your play's about. I had this conversation literally weeks ago um, with somebody who's doing a play of mine, and it's a big production, it's a big theater, and this director instantly became my favorite because that was how she began the conversation. She's like, I just want to hear what's the most important stuff about your play in your words, um, which gets me to say my top three things, and here it's this moment that matters the most. Um, and sometimes I have a very clear, it is a, it is a gesture. It is this scene, this line, this stage direction. That's the thing. That is the, the point of the entire play. And sometimes it's it's this scene. It's, you know, this scene is the one. Or you know, so it can be more general. But sometimes it's very specific. And if the director doesn't ask or you don't say, then it's going to be like the relationship game of trying to guess what somebody else is feeling and needs without ever saying it. So I would encourage all of you to to, to be able to talk as much as possible um, about that stuff early on because it just helps. Again, whether it's a one-day reading where you have four hours of rehearsal, um, or it's the beginning of a full, a full production, those kind of conversations are critical. Um, 
So the other thing is, when you actually have, say, audience feedback, oftentimes these uh, beginning or an early part of your new play process includes a talkback, like feedback. Um, I quite enjoy these, uh, but they can be overwhelming because there might be, unless you have a fabulous uh, person on hand like Laura to, uh, you know, volleyball action the questions to protect you. <laughs> Sometimes you can get people being like, I think you should change the name of your play to this. And you're like, oh, my gosh, we? So, <laughs> um, but I bring it up because it is an example of, again, keeping the relationship with the audience um, open uh, and welcoming. But if you have a pad of paper, which I would suggest you have and a pen, you can write anything you want down. <laughs> like, interesting. <laughs> Never. <laughs> that so, that's a great question. That's a great question. Right? So, um, but the fact that people are talking about your play is good news. The fact that they have opinion is good news. The fact that they feel strongly enough to be like, you should do this, is less good news, but still great. They're thinking about it. They're engaged. Awesome. But again, all of these examples, whether they're in a public setting or private setting, are a chance for you to flex those muscles that we talked about earlier, knowing yourself, knowing your voice, talking about your play, trusting that you can talk about your play. But then the question comes, OK, what if somebody's right? <laughs> what if the note is really, really on the nose? Um, and again, this is where it, it, it matters to have somebody that you trust, like I trust Laura, like I trust um, some other dramaturgs and directors that I work with, where they can come to me and go, OK, this might be hard to hear. <laughs> I think we're missing an opportunity in this play because you've made it about this thing, but it, I think it's actually about this thing. And it may be something where it feels like you get that hot feeling, like, oh, tell me how to write that. <laughs> um, but I will encourage you just to be open in certain conversations, and it's hard to know which ones are which, which one is a frivolous note and which one is a real substantial note. But again, this is why you have to have those people that you trust around you, because that's, that's the best news, is when somebody you trust has these um, notes for you. So um, I will say one thing that I often do, um, a very practical thing, is you can write down all of the notes, and then when I go and rewrite, I actually don't look at that list. Um, I don't, I, I, I put that away. If I go back and rewrite and page one or work on a scene, I kind of let whatever notes have stuck in my brain after a sleep are probably the ones that actually matter. Um, the other ones, it might have been an interesting note at the time, and it might have been a real specific note, it might have been, you've been drunk when you wrote it down, it's fine. Um, so the things that you can retain after a little bit of distance um, can add some clarity, and also not do the kind of donkey paddling rewriting where you're just like, I fixed all the notes, I fixed all the notes, right? <laughs> and do the more substantive, deep, deep thinking um, kind of notes. Um, I will also say in this conversation, because a conversation about notes is a conversation about rewriting, and for me, the strategy of rewriting um, is the greatest gift because rewriting is the writing. This is why I say when the first draft is done, that's when the work begins. Because it is through all of this process of hearing it, seeing it, discussing with a lot of different people. Um, that was the play beginning. <laughs> that's not an earthquake, I don't think. Uh, yes. <laughs> San Francisco, California jokes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So anyway, but this, this I, I take um, great thrill, and I hope eventually, if you don't feel this way already, you eventually will. That is the superpower of playwrights, is rewriting. Um, is That is when you discover the best version of the thing you made. Because unlikely, um, it will be the first thing that you've made. Um, in fact, almost impossible, because that first thing hasn't been tested by air and breath and blood and space and time. Um, and so that's when we get the, the real good news about it. Um, and you'll learn a lot of things. Um, I cannot advocate enough for cutting. <laughs> that is my very favorite thing to do. Um, it's just being like, nope. <laughs> um, because you will find your own rhythm, your own relationship with the kind of physics of live performance. Um, I certainly have mine, and it is spare and fast. So I often overrate and then until it's down to the kind of slim emotional quality that, that I, I really love and respond to. Um, but this is part of notes, part of the internal notes you give yourself, part of the response. Um, and again, if you surround yourself with great actors, um, in some ways, I wish that a play development kind of worked like this. You would have really amazing actors for the first couple of reads, like just the absolute greatest. 
and then terrible actors <laughs> or like a few readings in the middle where you go, oh my god, only that one person can make that funny. <laughs> okay, I need to find a way <laughs> to, um, to either never see my play when this person's not in it or um, to, to do some of this bridging work to make sure it's not just one person's great talent and charm that sells your play but the work in the world of it uh, itself sells it. And then go back to great actors when you're actually performing and then fancy people are reviewing it. That'd be nice. Um, <laughs> so uh, again, I think part of the, the, the confident playwright um, is one that can say, again, I don't know. Well, why did you, uh, what about this? And why does she say this and then say this later? You can be like, I, I don't know. Let me think about that. That's, my, that's the greatest answer of all time. Just always use it. <laughs> Um, because you do need space and time to think about things, and it doesn't have to be a band-aid. In fact, the more band-aids you put on the play, the more it's probably still broken, um, because it needs to, you actually need to do a more holistic uh, thing. Because as Laura mentioned, sometimes when you take something out, change someone's motivation, do this thing, it just messes with all the other dominoes you set up, and suddenly your tightly structured play is just a pile. Um, and that, that is fine, and it's part of the rewriting process as well. But the more that we can, be invested in rewriting um, and excited by it. Uh, for me, I like to think about playwriting in terms of almost like puzzle solving. It's, a, it's almost game, a game um, for me to solve something, to know, OK, this doesn't make sense, but it can't make sense. How does it make sense? If I do this, if I do that, if I move this, wait, I just move that there, copy, paste, oh, that thing makes sense. Ah. Right? So that you can have this um, problem solving attitude, which at a certain <laughs> Again, this starts to sound cold and not unartistic, um, but amazing how often <laughs> the craft of something does. Uh, where we're, we went from this place of I can write anything in the world and it's about heart and soul and politics and vision and beauty to um, engineering and business <laughs> and strategy. Um, but I think those things are actually healthy because you need, if you have all dreams and fantasy, there's nothing to ground it, there's nothing holding up the wonderful house. Uh, that you get to you get to decorate with your your vision and your, your dreams and your stuff. So anyway, back to the the sense of problem solving is a way that we can actively have agency over over something. Because oftentimes you'll get a note and it feels like I'm gonna have to rewrite this entire thing. And rarely do you actually have to do that, but sometimes you do. <laughs> Laura was actually present at the time when I was like, I will need to rewrite this entire thing. <laughs> <laughs> we have a production upcoming, um, but we're going to have to literally take the entire play, put it aside, not look at it, new document, start over, scene one. <laughs> um, and it was actually the best thing I ever did with that. Um, so and what sort of, oh, the computer is talking to us. Um, yeah, so there is a time when sometimes that is the best. The scariest thing is actually the best thing, and there are many reasons for why that that, that worked. <laughs> I generally try not to have to do that, but in this one case, it was the best thing for this, this play, full, full page rewrite. But um, practically, taking notes and implementing them when you're in a reading setting, a rehearsal setting, part of the playwright confidence is knowing that you can go pause. You guys talk about something, I need two hours to write or we will have new pages in the morning. Um, there is no apology to that. This is part of the process. This is the exciting part um, of creating new theater. So going in there, assuming that it's not perfect, is probably your best um, attitude um, because you're gonna find things, uh, and this happens in what we call in-page, um, more kind of the in-script changes that you can literally go, hold on, um, I'm gonna rewrite that line, strike that line, here's the new line, blah, 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 blah. People can write it into their scripts. There are insert pages where you go home, write a new scene, and bring in insert pages um, that they take out the old ones, put in the new ones, and the script keeps changing colors in fun ways if you use different color paper. Um, so all different ways of adjusting and constantly moving the thing forward. So again, adjusting those expectations for whatever notes you get, whether they be from you, from administration, from artistic collaborators, um, you can keep moving it forward. There's no like, well, we're done, except you're like in your previews and then you're most likely done for that production, um, at least. So again, feeling like the, this is why it, it, it takes a lot to write a play and knowing that that is, again, towards the beginning of the process. Um, because it would be a shame to have all these incredible collaborators and not have that feedback actually translate it to your great work. In some ways, uh, I would feel like I'm completely missing um, the magic of creation, and my plays would be a lot poorer for it. Um, and 
if I hadn't had the time to rewrite, react, move forward, see things, change. Um, so that's, that's the joy. And um, again, part of what we mentioned earlier is the strategy, whatever it takes to get in that room where you're with the actors around that table, doing that first reading, making the play better and better. And better. Um, that's part of why we want to talk about career strategy, cold practicality things, because that's where that magic happens, is in that note setting. So why don't we move to a little bit of questions uh, about this, and we can go back to our awesome list of questions, too, where we can continue to talk about yeah. I just want to recommend a process called Liz Lerman's yeah. process, which comes from choreography. Mm -hmm. It's about how you ask the audience the questions you need the answers to, as opposed to yes. letting them just say, Juliet wasn't hot enough, or yeah. some of those things they said. Yes, indeed. And that is part of um, when you start <coughs> Any reading or experience that you want to actually have critical feedback, being able to articulate um, what you are interested in. If you think, well, the second act is a little weird, I'm not sure the end is as satisfying, or at the beginning, I don't know if I have enough exposition, if it makes sense, um, this character I feel like doesn't quite end. There are all of those things are things you can kind of plant in actors or, or even an audience um, if you're doing uh, a reading, or certainly um, before a talk back uh, session as well. Yeah. Uh, yes. When uh, you're working on play, like how many other plays might you have in the development? I guess the, the question sort of is like, it's one thing to take notes and then sort of like take them in sort of organically and then just go straight to rewrite, but sometimes it's like, ah, that reading's done, now I'm gonna go work on this project. Yeah. And then it sort of leaves your brain in the sort of period. Yeah. Any thoughts about managing that? Um, I do manage a lot of things um, at one time. I think it helps to have things in different phases. So if you are in the, oh, I'm editing the galleys that are for this printed version, that's obviously very different than this is a brand new play that I'm, you know, hearing the first time. Um, I don't know how a perfect strategy for that. I do think, I, I think two phases of rewriting are, are best um, in tandem. So if you get those immediate notes uh, combined with whatever notes you're taking on your script as the reading is happening, going, that line's not good, I should move that there, that one, that's weird, cut that. Um, doing those quickly, mm -hmm. the next day, the next two days, getting that immediate stuff down, um, and then setting yourself some questions if there are bigger problems. Well, this this whole woman's arc, I don't know what the hell she's doing in the play, right? That's a thing that you can kind of have your brain work for a month, two, three, I don't know, and then come back to it with that kind of freshness. I always find <coughs> distance and time um, can really help in the bigger rewrites. How long, you don't ask me, how, like when you do one of those kind of quick rewrites, just I want to get this done, how much time do you give yourself for a full month play to, to rewrite it? I mean, sometimes that can be done in an hour. I oh. mean, if it's literally like, cut this, move that, that's not funny, this monologue is too long, cutting half of it. Because um, some of the instant reactions um, are good to capture. Those are the things that will probably fly away from your brain over a month. But again, those bigger, longer questions, what is the point? <coughs> is person's desire deep enough? Is the play's politics sharp enough? You know, do I care? Do I care about these people? That's a question of, well, and after a month or two, like literally in this crazy Uganda reading, I saw you just randomly read this play in the middle of the jungle. Um, I had this whole moment that I had never even uh, thought to, to put in there that really lengthened a relationship and added space. Um, it, it, it was a massive discovery in the middle of jungle, <laughs> um, but because I was reading it, I, because I hadn't read that play in a long time, in a, a month or two since the last time I, I talked about it. So space is good. It's like you need both the instant and the long, um, uh, depending on. But that's that's a great it's a great question. Thank you. So um, I get the revision process. So say you're premiering a play here, and you go through all of that at stage. And then a theater somewhere else picks it up and you're involved in that. How much do you keep revising and when? When do you have to stop because say it's does publication mean you can't fix it ever again? Or yeah. a great question. Um, I think, and this is going to sound like a luxury because so many of us are after that first production, but it takes two, two and a half productions really to get the thing um, because okay. yeah, to, to understand the play. And I'll, I'll, part of it is because um, we don't have endless rehearsals. Um, and in some ways, if we had not rehearsals, the plays would be worse, <laughs> because you, you can rehearse something too much. Um, but what you learn in that first production is what you learn in that first production, and there's a certain point when you're about to open the play that you can't actually keep adding acts and scenes and characters if like opening night is in two days. <laughs> so you can kind of cap the amount of things that you can do and the things that you can try in this production. But next production is totally up for grabs. Um, these new productions of The Windows, which we had the um, two productions last year that were happening at the same time, which were basically one for, that we could do rewrites for. 
And this next time, we've learned a ton and are rewriting and moving stuff around and you know, changing a lot of things. Um, so, but then, I mean, usually you stop when it's published, but as you know, there are new editions that, that come up and certain things. There's a couple that I, um, that I keep being like, uh, well, well, we had another production. IMU has been around for a, a, a while now, um, but we had a big production in London last year, and so they invited me to kind of rewrite. And I had wanted to because there was it's for younger characters, and so there was a lot of like Twitter references, which like oh, I miss Twitter anymore. So <laughs> but moving some of that stuff around and adding a couple moments um, <coughs> context needs needed some rewriting. So sometimes you get that opportunity, but yes, generally publication is when you're kind of like I hope to be done. I'd be super happy. I don't want to touch this. Unlikely, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how much do you or should you pay attention to uh, what theater critics write about your production? Does is, that ever prompt you to go out question. and change or just to say, oh, screw him? Screw Okay. Yeah, mostly, right. mostly screw okay. <laughs> I mean, yes and no. I, I am, of, uh, frankly, I'm of the opinion that. Um, this business is hard and complicated, um, and oftentimes, as deeply intelligent and well-read and well-meaning a lot of critics are, it is still hard to tell if a play does not work, whose quote-unquote fault it is. Um, so oftentimes, you can blame a play when it might be the wrong cast made this play not work, and or a director's vision was too overpowering or not powerful enough or whatever, whatever. Um, and it is really hard to blame to want to rewrite a whole play. Um, so anyway, it's, it, it's very complicated, it's also very sensitive and emotional, and if you get cracked on by a review, it feels really shitty. Um, and that has certainly happened <laughs> to me. And I feel like uh, I honestly have my family read reviews and tell me if I should read them, because I only want to read the good ones. <laughs> and that sounds self-preserving, and it is! This is super hard! Tell, oh, believe only the nice things people say about you. Um, <laughs> now, I mean, if somebody says something is really offensive, if there is um, a charge of, I don't know, a, 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 a maybe um, something that, that you could really learn from as a writer, uh, cultural appropriation, you know, something like that, that someone um, is saying, this felt to me like uh, a wrong spirited story, that's different than I didn't like, I didn't think it was funny, or I didn't, well, I obviously thought it was funny because I wrote it, and I like it. So you can kind of separate those things. Um, I would generally say don't read just don't read them unless they're glowing and you're like, you're the best writer in the earth. And I'm like, I am. <laughs> God, it's good to be me. <laughs> um, and the truth is, like, they all, I mean, very practical people say, like, well, if you believe the good ones, you have to believe the bad ones. And I say, no, you don't. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it, it is a fabulous question, and you're welcome to do what you will. Um, but oftentimes, people aren't reviewing just a play, they're reviewing a production. And that involves a lot of, uh, a lot of people. Um, and so it can, and, it, and sometimes they're just wrong. Sometimes, you know, I had a really hard review of um, my play, I and You, that came out um, at this theater. It was not good, it, absolutely terrible. Um, probably the worst review I've had, <laughs> in, kind of, in a kind of a dismissive way. And then that play went on to win, like, lots of awards <laughs> and be done in lots of places. So it, oftentimes they were wrong. They were the wrong. Or you know, he was right for who that person was who saw it. I'm not gonna tell him his um, his experience was incorrect because it was his experience, but um, long term that play did not deserve to die and be shoved and never seen again. Uh, so again, this is why it's one person's opinion really. It feels like it is the city of San Francisco's opinion of your play. But it's it's some guys or some girls. Yeah, I totally agree. <laughs> um, yeah, so especially with different audiences, we're kind of things are intended to totally Yeah, agree. yeah. Um, a question I had is about, um, you know, you really can rewrite forever before submitting. Yes. So how do you know when it's time to submit? That you feel, when when is the moment to feel ready enough? To, okay, this is ready to yeah. share. Yeah, that's super subjective, but I mean, I will say. Hmm. Again, it depends on where you're submitting. If you're submitting to workshops, to, to have, if, if the prize upon winning uh, is a workshop, a development, mm -hmm. ends of the public reading, that's a place that's basically asking you to keep working on it. Mm -hmm. So I think those um, opportunities, once you've had a few in-home readings, once you, you know, you feel like you've heard it out loud, like let's just say twice, like mm -hmm. to at least two out loud readings, mm -hmm. um, 
uh, and the time to rewrite and think, and then start submitting. Because I think, I, I, I would not say like wait forever, wait 10 years to make sure you had every great idea. Um, because again, so much of that work is happening in the room. So you can't do a lot of the work until you're in the room with time and actors. And so yeah, I'd say don't, don't wait too long. Yeah. Yeah. Um, something that I've witnessed a couple of times, um, generally in like audience feedback or, or like a cohort in the back of the class or something, um, and something that I'm very terrified of yeah. is um, people insinuating things about you and who you are from what you've written, be it true or not, and how, what are some techniques for deflecting that or dealing with that? Because it's, it's thankfully I've never experienced it. There were, I remember some time in class when it was very sticky and I was like, how can I explain that this person wrote a character? Yeah. It's not them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I think again, going back to the magic of being able to speak about the play outside of the play mm -hmm. um, and being able to say, this is a play with um, a really racist character or this is a play that is um, a person that is a little bit despicable, or you know what I mean, whatever you want to kind of frame it as, and, and being able to say part of what the play is exploring is. Or even, no, I don't want to talk about that issue. Or yes, yeah, 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 yes. I mean, I think, again, using words outside of it is totally fine to be like, this is, you know, I mean, you could always say, oh, I always just make jokes about things. <laughs> yeah, but, but yes, I, I think the way you talk about it, um, uh, you can either, I mean, it's probably best to name it, and then it's just a thing that somebody's named and you can move on, but, yeah, I don't know, I don't have a perfect answer for that, but I'd be interested to how that plays out. Mm -hmm. You can share it with us later. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. There are joke takey things. Um, and, you know, all this goes into process in terms of what actually happens, like, if your play is selected to have a reading um, at a theater like this one. Um, I would say try to not think of it as an audition for a production um, because just separate the steps in the process. Um, and I will also say that one of the, the truest things about this business is that you work with a lot of the same people over and over again. So don't be a dick. <laughs> people will know um, if you are unpleasant to work with, if you are demanding, if you are, you know, um, unduly these things. Like, yes, you can have very firm opinions about things, um, but I think making a place that is welcoming and open um, uh, is nothing but good news for for those of us who, who work in this business and will give you even more oof in terms of like I like that I like working with that person the room is good um, when they're when they're in there so that's one thing just to you know think about be nice <laughs> um, yeah just a practical question what about like copy editing for punctuation and grammar and spelling yeah. Um, Do it. Is that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hate that. I'm, I will be honest, and Laura knows this story very well. I am terrible at copy editing, terrible at typos, <laughs> so embarrassing. Always like have, showing up at like a very nice theater, and I'll be like, I misspelled there like six times. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just terrible. So like I, I I would say yes, do that because I've been oh it's just it's embarrassing, it's deeply embarrassing. Um, <laughs> luckily people. People know me enough to be like, oh, stupid Lauren. <laughs> so anyways, but yes, I would say that, that that makes a good impression to you know spell things correctly. <laughs> and then sometimes I, I have had people that I've paid to do that for me because I know I'm so terrible at it, so I will be like, can you please help me um, look at it, which is not legal. Do that. Yeah, is this the time in which we need to comment on the format? Sure. So sure. What, what what are the ways away, and, and not the obvious yes. things like don't use double fonts, but, but what are the yes. professional signposts? Um, yes, let's let's write a little bit of a thing. Um, okay, so the way I generally do it on title page, let's just start there. Title page, title page, title. Um, let's see, this is the top, I literally like, put it in the middle make it big-ish, but not like so freaking massive, but like that, right? Um, and then I say, by me, um, draft three. Uh, and I will usually, if you have representation, you can put their info here in the bottom of the, uh, kind of the left-hand side, um, or your email, personal email, Lauren, blah, blah, blah. Um, and that's kind of it. Uh, yeah. 
If it is adapted on something, you can say based <coughs> on antigone or something. Like, I would say use this sparingly. You don't need a whole description of like, a brand new fabulous modern farce based on <laughs> but just, you know, a musical, a, a comedy, a, you know, you can do like one, three words there. Um, yes, so that's, that's basically it. Yeah. So there are softwares available that do this automatically. Would you say they're reliable? Um, I usually do. That's a fabulous question. Um, both Final Draft and Scrivener. Um, Scrivener is a little bit wonky, but but Final Draft is generally good. Um, it is. It frankly will look like a screenplay, like for movies or for TV. I usually do my work in uh, with just a Word document and format it myself. And there's a couple reasons for that. Um, one is because it slows me down while writing. Sometimes Final Draft is too fast. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, it sounds like a good thing to be fast, but um, it can, uh, I get lost in their form, like the formatting takes over um, for that for me, but in a play, because we, there are options for formatting, it is more free in final draft, I mean in, uh, in, in Word, um, or whatever kind of general word processing software uh, that you have. I would say, um, Usually, the font doesn't matter too much, but nothing gregarious. I would say you can just go for your old Arial, your old, you know, Times New Roman career if you want to, you know, do that kind of thing. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I also, like, I, I play a little bit with font, not within a document with different fonts, but I found one that my eyes just really like. It just makes me very happy to see it, so I, I just use so that one. Buy our fast. Um, I don't know, what do you think, Laura? I mean, like, what? Like, don't use, like, the curly Q ones, but... Right, right. But I, mean, I think you could use like this in all terms of fonts. They're not going to throw it away because I use curly. I don't think so. No, no, no. And, and there will be several different ones that you can, that you can um, reference. Like, some, some people, certainly who come from TV and film, use curly because that's what writing is uh, to them. But anyway, yes. Okay. Uh, do you put on uh, copyright or uh, uh, registered with writers Guild uh, or anything like that? I should say no. Um, you should put the date. Just the date. Yep. <clears throat> no copyright. <laughs> um, it is presumed, um, and it is. It is. Uh, yeah, I've never ever done it. Um, and you don't need to register it with anybody. Um, if there, it's better to register like an idea, like a pitch. Um, if you were to register anything, but it's basically a waste of time. I would say no. So some people, uh, this is interesting because some people, <coughs> local writers, actually say we'll want to see the copyright symbol on it. Really? For whatever reason, they want that there. I always thought that was a bit it's silly. Weird. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Yeah. I think so. Um, just unnecessary. Yeah. So, so no snail mail, no phone number? Yeah, you can put it all. Any okay. way to contact it, I should just say contact. Okay. Yeah. Any, any just general information. If you have a website, put it there. That's good to do. Yeah. So what's the point of putting the draft? It seems like if you put draft two, then it seems like you didn't do much work, and if you put draft after fourteen, it seems like. <laughs> I mean, it's mainly for you to keep track of your drafts. Pardon? It's mainly for you to keep track of the drafts. Oh, but you don't send it out with that then. Mm -hmm. you do? Yep. Um, because it is for me, it is. Um, it would be very confusing to say it's draft one, but I know it's draft four, and to, for some presentation purposes. I mean, I, I've never had any issue with it being like draft 13 or whatever. It, to that, it says that it's had development. You've had thir 13 rewrites. Basically, the draft number for me means a total rewrite. In my own little crazy brain, I put dots, so I'm like draft 3.3, which to me means like I changed some things, but it's not a whole rewrite. But if I had a whole rewrite, like literally top to bottom, then it's like, no, I'm on to four. And it's totally arbitrary, but whatever it is for you to keep track, to keep track of that, and I mean, if you, I don't think people are, you don't take any meaning from that, do you? If there's draft, no, like, some people are sure to be using draft dates, though. Like, yes. like, like June 15, 2019 yes. draft. That way it doesn't give people a counter on the number of rewrites. That's a great point, yeah. And it allows you to track it just as easily. Mm -hmm. um, yes, yeah, so you could not even put draft, you could just put the date if you want. There's, there's a benefit to having uh, some marker of which draft it is for your own internal knowledge because. Um, Say there's a, a festival or something with a long reading arc, like it takes them a long time to get through things. By the time they're done, they'll say, Hey, we like your play. Do you have a more current draft? And you write back, Which one did I send you? And they're like, I don't know. Which one did you send? So if you have a draft date June 15th and then you've worked on it since then, you have a draft date July 9th, you're like, Oh, do you have the June 15th one? Here, at least I need the updated one. Yeah. Yes. 
Um, okay, so then this is when we're into the actual document. Uh, scene, I always do scene one. Um, or you can do act one, scene one if you've got more than one act, but um, scene one. Uh, these are stage directions. Put them in italics um, and close them up in uh, parentheses. They're indented like twice or three times. Again, this kind of total accuracy is not as necessary as the general concept. And the reason all of this is is making it readable. The only thing you need your script to do is be readable and understandable and not be a project and needing a codex to understand how, how to read it. So make it really clear. I have no issue with long stage directions, short stage directions, no stage directions, whatever it is to convey um, what's going on. I will say that long stage direction, as Trevor mentioned, might be skimmed over. So in your fabulous description, as poetic as it wants to be, I, um, if it's in here, like, but no, you're setting up a play. Like, where is it? What's going on? What time of day? I don't know. Things you need to kind of start, to start it. Um, all of this would be, actually, like that. Um, if there is something really important, um, she enters with her arm chopped off and bleeding, I would underline or bold it just to make sure that somebody reading doesn't be like, oh, why is she screaming? <laughs> um, so anyway, that is just like a little secret trick. Um, this conversation about stage directions can go on all night because I love it. Um, but again, you can add the tone of your play into the stage directions. Um, I think that is a surefire way of making it clear that it is a comedy, a farce, in frickin' verse, um, it is whatever, um, it's a very serious play, it's a political play, whatever it is, you can add that stuff in here. And sometimes, again for my play, I knew what this is about, two teenagers, there's stuff where she goes like, she gives him an oh shut the fuck up face. Right, Th that is not a physical description, but an actor can read that and go, oh I know what that is, and a reader will go, oh. This is not the like Edwardian style <laughs> describing <laughs> ladies' behavior. Um, so you can do, you can make it your own. Um, again, sticking within that kind of format so that the, the reader doesn't have to reinvent how they are reading plays to enjoy yours. Um, I there is a little bit of um, decision. I mean, a uh, 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 option on this, but uh, I tend to do character in the middle of the page, that is the character name, and then the line starts here. Left line, right? Yeah, left line. Again, just for readability. Sometimes if you, you see it with the character over there, the British tend to do that, but screw them. <laughs> um, <laughs> maybe I just find it really easy to, to, to read it right there. You know who's in the scenes. Um, the actors can find it really easily. Well, you bold the name. <laughs> I don't bold it. Or or I don't bold bold the yeah. Um, yeah. And if uh, so, character. He's gonna start writing actual names. Then says something. What? Um, and then jokes. Mm -hmm. Ah. Um, if it's internal, like somebody is speaking and then has a gesture or there is a descriptor of this next line, um, you can put the same character uh, and put the same parentheses but in between the line just to kind of assign it to a person. It's not like everyone is joking, it's just been. <laughs> um, yeah, remember to put your page number, please Lord. Do not forget to put your page numbers, please Lord. Please to all the Lords, put your page number. Um, and I like to put uh, um, some, some um, contests will have different requirements, like you have to put your name or the name of the play on the left, you know, again, whatever makes it easiest to read. Um, do you have a preference on that, Laura? About if they put their like, name or play name on the bottom? If it's a blind competition, do not put your name anywhere on it. If it is not a blind competition, please, for the love of God, put your name on it. <laughs> Great. Um, How it happens is not Yeah. On yeah. yeah. On the footer. In the footer. In the sure. footer. Sure. Yeah, it will help you later when you're cutting slices of plays to submit uh, script samples. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. He exits. Um, so, the name, so the name of the play or your name? I'll take your name. Yeah. My name. I will make that clear. Thing. As, sorry, yeah. Ruby got you to format similarly, but you put a colon. That's just your thing, right? Um, I think a lot of people put colons. Okay. 
Yeah. So that's not a throwaway description. No. Okay. Yeah, no, that's but to me for some reason I get lost. This is very clear, like okay. yeah. it's not something being like Bang! <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever um, use short parentheticals on the same line? Choking, pleading would be what? Choking, huh? No. Never? Because it, to me again, separating an action from a line. Mm -hmm. Just making it readable, and I will say a lot of white space on a page is just more readable. It means you can flip those pages quicker, and you're feeling the kind of movement of something. So I, I, I think that that kind of chops things up a little bit. And just to follow up, if it's a slight directorial pleading, the way he's delivering that line, mm -hmm. you still put. It? That's fine. Yeah. yeah. So what um, pleadingly? Ah, I don't know what you're <laughs> saying. <laughs> Um, yeah, um, so, um, it's, uh, you know, on and on and on. Thank you. Um, so, uh, there's different ways to get to a next scene. Sometimes you can just put something like transition, which is a little bit different than blackout. Like, the options for a scene are kind of, he can exit blackout. And that would be within, within the parentheses. Um, again, you know, there's a little, a little room uh, for this. Blackout can be one. You can just put he exits, and the director will most likely know if there's a next scene. If <laughs> you need to find a transition, you could perhaps choose blackout or not. Um, I will say, in general, when you're formatting a script, um, much like the underline that somebody's leg is falling off or, <laughs> or something of, of import, making sure to make the most important things the most important things. So you can you know, do a lot that you want with, with stage directions, designing. Just, I will say, don't design costumes unless they are critically important. Don't design the set unless it is critically important to the story. Um, that's not your job. <laughs> if you are, if the story is engaging with sound design or engaging with lighting, a play of mine is called Silent Sky, it's about astronomy and stars are light. So that is a, it is a back and forth with me and the design lighting designer of that show. So in the text, there are discussions of, of, of lighting things. But for most of my plays, I don't have lighting once, because again, it's not my job. Um, so focusing on the things that are most important, big exits, big entrances, big he slaps her, he slaps him, um, they kiss, they can fight, they whatever, um, fall down and weep. Um, I would say, in, like sneaky advice, uh, ask, uh, um, count how many times you are weeping in your and maybe stick to one or two. <laughs> Every scene, she weeps openly. Oh my god! Um, <laughs> um, also kisses. Also like aggressive actions. If you have like every other scene is a sex scene, every other scene is them making out. Every other scene is like a fist fight. Like okay, whoa, slow down. <laughs> um, again, building the the point of the play. I think there's a great moment towards the end where things kind of uh, come out. So anyway, savings, <laughs> saving some stuff. Knowing that, and this would happen very quickly in a rehearsal, you would see like, oh my god, they kiss all the time. <laughs> um, just knowing that, uh, one of my favorite writers, Larissa Fasthorst, we were talking about uh, notes she always gives and you know how actors tend to want to make a moment out of all the moments. And part of the job as directing and writing is to be like, no, sorry, you don't get all the moments. You do not get all the moments. You gotta move along. You gotta say the line and move along. This is not your moment. I will give you one moment. You can take all of it in there. Um, and her note was like, yeah, actors get to cry once and then shut the fuck and move on. <laughs> so you can help in the play by maybe not just watching how many great, you know, physical, super emotional, you know, crazy breakdowns you get. I would say put them in there because they're awesome and it's great for actors and you will, it becomes very amazing to watch. But um, okay, what else about formatting? Um, yeah, you know, scene two, scene three, end of show, literally right, I would say the end. At the end, that should probably be in the middle of it, but you know, do what you want there.